Well, all right, you guys. Let's see. This is a <laughs> experiment with technology. Sorry. That doesn't let me turn, and he's a big truck. Um, uh, yeah, I guess. Oh, no, it's the other car holding him up. Um, it's hot today in D.C., and uh, I have to go out one more time, so I'll talk to you from the car. I don't normally do this, as you know. All right, there goes a the puppy dog. Red light, green light. Okay, let's do this without tipping you over. So I just want to give you some thoughts from that call last night. Um, I don't have a prepared list or anything. Uh, so it'll be free form. But um, I really thought that uh, Kristen Shaughnessy did a great job. Dennis Neal did a great job. And there were some other people there. You know, Optimus came on and acquitted himself very well. Um, and of course, Patrick Burns was, sen Burn was sensational because his understanding of it is so uh, deep. So I hope people learned a lot. I learned things. Uh, and then Busy did a great job. Junk Savvy was over the top. I'm sure she has a face for movies and a voice for radio. Um, this is a lot of braking and all that. So when I get on the highway, I won't have to keep reaching over. Our roads are built, you know, as an afterthought. And we send trillions overseas and as you know that makes uh what was that group called black uh they changed their name that mercenary group black something um black water it makes them wealthy beyond all dreams if you drive out of dc you can see their homes i mean they live they live like little princes and the key is Congress always votes for war. So they mark everything up and they make huge profits. Why not as an electorate, why don't we just say to Congress, hire Blackwater, make them rich as Crocious, but have them redo our roads, have them put in some high speed trains Let's get 5G, if, unless it's unhealthy, for our, for our uh, phone networks. Let's uh, bring back uh, industry. Let's be able to fabricate tools and parts and uh, toasters and, and uh, all manner of things. It used to be the United States didn't have to worry about international uh, situations because we owned our own industrial might. I, I don't think that's true anymore. Uh, where would we go if we had to build a, you know, a fleet of jeeps? We go to Mexico or China or Japan. And if we're at war, that becomes prob problematic. Anyway, let's get off of that. I just think we should let these thieves get rich. Um, now I'm going to go through Georgetown, which is not ideal, but it's all right. But let's at least get something for it in the United States. Anyway, and by the way, the you've heard of the velocity of money. It's the concept that, for example, uh, Republicans jump all over they used to quote unquote welfare queens and I'm not supporting I'm not trying to be supportive of welfare queens but if you give somebody assistance and they don't have much money and let's say you give them 20 grand 15 10 grand a year 
that 10 grand gets spent right away. It goes into the rent, it goes to food, it goes to the doctor, it goes to the veterinarian, it goes to the clothing store. And then those uh, people have to pay taxes on their profit, but then they spend that money on an automobile, on an education, on, on a rug, on a painting. And then those people pay taxes and that they bought that from and so on. It's called the velocity of money. But if you give money to the head of Blackwater, he buys a bunch of bombs. He probably squirrels some, some of the way. The bomb goes down on a desert somewhere and ruins our reputation. And there's no velocity of money. I mean, there's a little bit at the arms plant, but that's about it. The arms plant is already rich. Um, oh God, I guess I'll go through I'm telling you when you drive, you rely on idiots, idiots. It's for you. You rely on idiots making decisions it can be quite frustrating, but of course I'm not an idiot. All right, let's talk about the call. Um, the thing that stood out to me the most, which was both depressing, illuminating but depressing, is Patrick Byrne pointed out that Wall Street used to have these wonderful agency businesses. And um, he didn't define he didn't define that. But basically, Wall Street used to be a great place to work. Um, in-house, in-house, you, your firm would make markets in certain stocks. You had trading desks. You had research. If a company like Tilo had a big announcement, uh, like they did uh, a month or so ago, a research analyst would put out a buy recommendation, and that analyst would come out across the system-wide squawk box and you'd listen to it along with thousands of other brokers. And then all of a sudden, you know, maybe 5% of those brokers, could be a few hundred, would call their clients and build a position and the stock starts going up and it self uh, fulfills in a way because then the uh, research analyst is meeting with the CEO and the CEO says, hey, I need to raise some money research analyst goes to the investment banker in in-house and all of a sudden you get a deal done above market with research with retail but now you do a road show and you get institutional buying it's the complete opposite of what happens now with the criminal jeff easton and the criminal kurt kramer and their attorneys, I think, uh, you know, the attorneys are going to say, hey, we're just uh, following the rules. Now, they're, look, intent, they intend to defraud us. So that's good enough for me. By the way, everything I say here, like what I just said and everything on the video is in my own opinion and my own judgment. If you find Kurt Kramer to be an honest man and that he would never do anything like that like one IR guy said on on uh, uh, Twitter I won't mention his name but he helped he helped direct our money toward another CEO who took 34 million out of the market they all work together don't trust anybody coming in with a smile I mean it don't trust them, particularly gravelly voices and whiskey, whiskey rounded voices, and they're there to help. Don't trust them. Um, well, what scared, what it did frighten me. Wall Street, as Patrick Burns said, let me see if I can close this and maybe turn on the AC. Yeah, that works, maybe. Um, Patrick said that the agency businesses are gone. So think what that means. Think what that means. 
that means what I just described to you, those were all sources of revenue, except for research. Research was always a bit of a burden, but investment banking paid for it. And um, I don't know if I just ran a red light. I might have. I might have. Um, do you hear the sirens? I don't. Um, so all those sources of revenue work on commissions. Yes, stock loan as it used to be. Uh, investment banking, building companies from a small company to, I guess I can go, I have no idea. Thank you, sir. You're starting to think I'm an idiot when I drive. Well, you might have a good argument. Um, so what, what has replaced all of that for Wall Street. They don't even have in-house management per se. I mean, a, a company like Leg Mason had its own funds. Merrill Lynch had Malam. And I'm sure uh, uh, the rest have some in-house funds. But brokers are now aren't brokers. They're wealth advisors. They're wealth managers. And what they do when you call, that you call them is they they build up a plan as if their plan is any anything different than you could do and they diversify across you know three or four different industries and they buy etfs or they tell you to go into a managed account where they collect one and a half percent for themselves doing nothing more than getting you to sign it every year you put in a million dollars they get uh, 15 grand a year for doing nothing and if they if they have a hundred accounts they got 150 uh, no 1.5 million a year I guess I I'm not so great at all this arithmetic in my head while I'm driving and trying not to hit other cars. But you get the point. That's what Wall Street is, managed money. Uh, the brokers don't know anything about finger. They don't know about the short sell. They don't know anything. They call it their wealth advisors. And so Wall Street's model is they split the firms apart and you've got, you've got Wall Street, let's take a Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs brokerage and then you've got Goldman Sachs Prime Brokerage. Well, what Goldman Sachs, the, the, the paradigm of free markets, no government regulation, let's get Bill Clinton to sign that derivatives don't have to be regulated, free markets. Well, what Goldman Sachs did, they had access during the financial crisis to Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns book before anybody else. I think maybe Morgan Stanley was in there, but they got to select the best assets, but they also knew how to trade against those assets. That was, that was corrupt. But then what Goldman Sachs did, they decided to become a bank. So they're insured, they're insured by the, it's so hot in here, by the federal, by you, the taxpayer. So they take outlandish risks and you're the backstop because they're too big to fail. All these arrogant, wealthy people. Why, why do we glorify this? Um, remember, Jimmy Rogers said, often Jimmy Rogers said, the co-founder of the Quantum Fund with George Soros, everybody's honking at me but they didn't see the dog walking across the street. And in my book, dogs come first. Anyway, Jimmy Rogers says in the future, stockbrokers will drive taxi cabs. And I'm not driving one yet. And uh, 
farmers will drive Maseratis. So just remember that as you make your career decisions. Although, when I finish this point, I'll bring something up. So, uh, the traditional, Goldman Sachs split in two, they all did it. But the traditional Goldman Sachs, let's call it brokerage, all of the profit items are gone except maybe collecting, uh, you know, accumulating assets and possibly um, because of their prestige, they get to be the financer of, a, let's say, a young Mark Zuckerberg and bring him from, from stealing his roommate's idea to being one of the wealthiest men in the world. And then Wall Street focuses on six or seven stocks. There's no broad development of a lot of technology ideas. You know, there's no, ver no inflated stock price that allows companies to go acquire talent and other, other companies, other, other revenue streams. All of it comes to these thieves. Look at, look at what happened with AMC the other day. AMC, I'm sorry for the boom, 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 boom. But AMC, uh, we're going through Georgetown now. Very, you know, very posh. Posh. Do you know what posh, where posh comes from? Do you know the expression posh? I'm not quite sure why it matters, but I guess it's for the views. Um, it stands for port side out bound, starboard home. So when, when you used to get on the ships, the best cabins had a view of the port side outbound, starboard, inbound, and that you abbreviated, it's posh. How's that for today's tidbit? You probably have a, an abbreviation for, hey William, you're full of shite. All right, now we're going through Georgetown. So anyway, Goldman has now this one uh, silo, let's call it, where their, their business basically, I mean, this is the way other brokerage firms used to be. Goldman used to stand alone, but now they're just like common like the rest. But you could substitute any brokerage house. Um, so. Their goal is to gather assets, put assets under management. They charge the retail client or even the institutional client 3%, three points of the assets under quote unquote management. And they, uh, you know, half that fee goes to the broker, the wealth advisor, and maybe half a percent goes to the money manager and a percent goes to the house. It all is negotiated, but that's basically, it used to be one, one, one. I thought the stockbroker, the wealth advisor would be the one to get squeezed, but it turned out it was, it's the money manager that gets squeezed. So anyway, that's their business model. Just get assets under management. Now, occasionally they will come to you and offer something to you like a, uh, like a, a ETF or a new offering, you know, a, uh, I can't think of one from Goldman Sachs, but they might offer you a BlackRock uh, new ETF bust plus trust fund that invests in commercial real estate and it offers you 8% yield with an equity kicker and they're going out and they're buying up all the real estate at a distressed value and you have to get in, you have to get in. Well, deals like that pay the broker, the wealth advisor, 
I, I don't know what it is anymore, but it, it could be as high as 8%. And depending on the broker's payout, they get 60% of that, 50% of that across their run. And, uh, you know, it's a nice payday. You raise, you raise a hundred thousand dollars, eight grand. You do it in a day. You get four grand across your your production run. It's nice. It's a nice business. And there might even be a trail on the end of it. Anyway, that's the kind of retail business that Wall Street's making money on. The rest of it, all the rest of it, largely got moved over to their prime brokerage and more importantly the 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 uh, the they used to call them proprietary desks but all the trading and all the the talent went out and started hedge funds and I'm speaking broadly now those hedge funds become clients of the prime broker they also provide commission if if for some reason the hedge fund was brought in by a retail broker or an institutional broker, a wealth advisor. They provide commission revenue streams to the first part of the first uh, pillar of the investment bank. But the prime, what what um, Patrick Burns was describing last night. Now we're going across Key Bridge into Roslyn. Do you know what Jimmy Carter and Key Bridge have in common? This is an old joke. It's not very polite anymore. That we're going over Key Bridge right now. But you know what Jimmy Carter and... Uh, sorry, Roslyn Carter and Key Bridge have in common? Uh, sorry. Uh, what Jimmy Carter and Rosalind oh god I'm ruining the joke what Jimmy Carter and Key Bridge have in common they both go in and out of Rosalind get it they both go in and out of Rosalind it's hilarious hilarious it was even funnier back then um you can see that I'm a hilarious guy. I want to go straight. I don't want to turn. I want to get on Route 50. Right, so in Roslyn, there's a lot of construction because in the district, there's a height restriction on buildings. There, no, uh, There's some violation of it, but no buildings can be higher than the rot the capital rotunda. So in Roslyn, which is Virginia, you can build skyscrapers. When, and you know, if these were in New York, they'd be very small. But you can build tall buildings. So anyway, what happens is uh, all the risk, all the reward goes to the prime brokerage. But in the in the in the I don't know the retail quasi institutional business that stays behind, they have FDIC insurance because they were too big to fail, and that's why they go buy banks so they have more depositors, and. Uh, I'm just focusing on oh, driving, driving you crazy. So anyway, um, that's what's changed on Wall Street. Now, one of the biggest sources of revenue, as Patrick Burton said, for the prime broker is the stock loan desk. And as he stated it last night on the call uh, for Goldman Sachs, a hundred, you know, obviously he's exaggerating, 150% of Goldman Sachs's profits come 
from the stock loan desk, which is no risk. They hypothecate, which is just mimeographing. It's just selling the title to your stock over and over and over again, collecting fees, stock borrow rates, uh, the ETFs they create, by the way, that you put your money in and you just sit in blindly, and I'm not picking on you. Um, the ETFs lend out their stock, but you don't know about that. You don't get anything for that. So this this circle jerk is, and as Pat Burns said, it creates a river of money. And I'm paraphrasing, but it corrupts everybody. It corrupts the lawyers, it corrupts the regulators, Congress, um, everybody, everybody. And it's how Wall Street makes its money. It's how Wall Street makes its money. So the the thing that scared me last night is realizing we're trying to fix, a, we see it as enforcement of the rules and fixing a violation. What we don't recognize is the entire Wall Street setup as Patrick Burns said, this used to be done um, as a mistake or an exception that got immediately fixed years ago. Now it's a business model for Wall Street. It is the business model for Wall Street. The business model. So we're we're up against it. We're we're two scorpions in a box. And uh, we're the small scorpion. They're going to fight us to the absolute death. They're, they will hire smiling faces on Twitter to cajole you, tell you that other people are jerks. What about this record? What about that? Oh, they're bad. Oh, uh, William lost his cool. Uh, oh, William was mean to this guy. Uh, they'll do anything to discredit the truth. And I'm not saying I'm a paradigm of the truth. I'm just saying they don't want you to understand what's going on. And somebody said on my call last night, it's so complicated. It's not complicated. They're Xeroxing uh, Mrs. O'Leary's 1,000 shares of Exxon into 10 or 15,000 shares of Exxon they're loaning that out and they're making money. On top of that, these guys that, um, uh, this is the exact same intersection when I bought a brand new Scirocco, had my girlfriend next to me coming home from a Christmas party where I hadn't, I did, for some reason I didn't drink. I had an accident right here, which wasn't my fault. Helpfully, she jumped out of the car. She had been drinking. And the two people driving were Indians. And <laughs> she, she jumped out. Why don't you go back to your own effing country? <laughs> it's not helpful. <laughs> Please. But anyway, um, bless her heart. She was just defending me. Um... So, Wall Street has a lot at stake. They've captured, as, as uh, Patrick Byrne pointed out, they've captured the uh, regulators because that same person who is suing Kurt Kramer for the third violation uh, that, they, that they've chosen to uh, make a complaint on, they want the job at Gibson Dunn. They want the job at the prestigious law firm. So they don't want to give, they don't want to hurt that law firm's client. Somehow, Kurt Kramer has a senior partner at Gibson Dunn. I forget his name now. Gray hair, nice smile. All the girls love him. Kurt Kramer's a thief. But he's got the top guy at Gibson Dunn. And, you know, it's not a small crime. 325 companies. The other thing that came across in the call, and Ham elaborated on it, 
afterward is just how much money these guys make uh, stealing in the over-the-counter markets. And you got to remember, ever since the so-called Merrill Lynch rule, no broker will um, advise their clients to buy a stock under five dollars. That wealth advisor, no, no institutional buy under ten dollars. So there's no buying, and um, there's no research. There's not. There's no support for these stocks. So it's like shooting fish in a barrel. Anyway, enough on this point. Uh, it made me depressed because I realized that everybody's in on it. Wall Street simply will not go down quietly and they're going to pull out all the stops to allow this to continue. Now there was a guy on, I'm going to get his name wrong, Terry uh, Nickel. Uh, where have, where are all the little boys? Anyway, it's different in Canada. He talked about how they are making some progress. Uh, the guy Pulte, Bill Pulte, came on and he had a big room of 500 investors and they're getting to know. Junk Savvy, Busy Brands, all of you guys. There are some smart people on there that I, like Curtis was on there, Optimus, uh, a guy I think named Michael. Um, but but the knowledge of this is getting out. And I'll, I'll tell you one thing. Next bridge better not trade. Ever. In no fashion. No way, no how. Because as, as um, Patrick Burns called it, X clearing, it's just these derivatives. It's these default swaps. It's these contracts that they draw up to hedge against each other and then companies, your futures my future, become just ping pong balls that Wall Street hits back and forth amongst each other there's no concern for anything except their greed and sating their desire for more, more more, well anyway quickly, there is an opportunity for young people in this because if we win and we can, if we win, Wall Street's going to have to return to its roots. I hope they undo the FDIC insurance. They'll break up the big banks. But the big banks will break up all by themselves because their businesses aren't profitable. And once they get rid of this stealing, um, they'll have to chop and cut and become smaller and then other young upstarts will come in and the young upstarts will be will become the uh, will become the uh, will become the investors the, the investment banks of old chill out dude you're driving a rental truck with a with a Honda on the back. Um, so the opportunity is they're going to need real stockbrokers. They're going to need people who can actually give advice and create business and bring in order flow. So there's an opportunity there. It all cycles, but I, for, for a while, it's going to be a really depressing place to work. All right, that's long enough on that topic. Um, um, what else did I hear last night that impressed me? Well, 
you know, the two journalists, Dennis Neal and Kristen Shaughnessy, came on, and there was another one that was a journalist. I don't remember the name, and I saw Brianna was there. I think she's a journalist. Uh, but my point is, is that the story is getting out, and the it's you know once people understand it that it's just stealing it's just mimeographing your title to your shares over and over and over again and they give you all these complicated words they give you all this complicated description they befuddle you so you come in thinking oh I'm an idiot and these guys are so smart trust me the average wealth advisor, the average stock broker, the average one is not all that smart. They're honest, I think. And it's an advantage not being smart because you can do the same thing day in and day out. You can believe your own spit. Well, I think you need to be in the uh, John Hancock Life Insurance uh regional bank trust bust fund and we'll we'll put five percent there and let's put twenty percent in uh, the the American growth fund and uh, you know we'll we'll elide the issue that the market's been up over twenty percent a year for a decade and coming up it might be a lot less and we'll diversify what they leave out is it's not diversified it's all stock it's equity what's coming my friends is going to be a return to the unwillingness of retail investors to put money in the stock market and they won't even want to put money in mutual funds. That's what's coming. Because the devastation is going to be so broad, so severe, and so permanent. Um, I can't tell if I need to buy gasoline. That... Um, it'll ruin a couple of generations. Now, I think the stock market's gonna go up 40% before that happens. Could happen this summer. Could take all year. Could take 18 months. But I think the market is gonna to go to just nosebleed highs. And there's an opportunity in all that. There'll be rotation into um, uh, other leaders away from the technology but I think these technology stocks are going to still run so I, I, I don't think we have to have that pit in our stomach we can we're going to have a chance to make logical reallocations of money and you know I as boring as it sounds and and there's risk in terms of currency risk and and uh, interest rate risk but you know, one of the safest things we can do is maybe put a little money in the, you know, a 90-day T-bill directly with the Treasury. At least you know you're going to get it. And we live in the United States, so we want our money to come back to us from the government. But it, there's going to come a time to uh, uh, hunker down. What an awful word, hunker down. All right, I'm going to take the chance that I can go without gasoline until I return. All right, so uh, I'll just finish on that point because I'm almost where I need to be. I think all these journalists, all the attention, and then Patrick Byrne coming on was fantastic. People know what they're talking about. 100, you've got to be amazed with his knowledge. Uh, people are understanding that th that these criminals start stocks trading offshore so they can lie. Hey, William, what did you do today? Oh, I went by the park and then uh, 
went by school. Oh, that's great. Well, what I really did is I hitchhiked with uh, Robert Biggs. We hitchhiked, and while we were hitchhiking, we went, we stood in beside the park, and then we got dropped off on Hull Street Road, and we were right in front of the school, but we were hitchhiking on our way to the mall where all the, the girls are. So was I being truthful? No. Yes, no. That's all they do. They lie. Oh, we got we got to locate, or we believe we're going to get a locate offshore. And then, oh, that's great, 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 great. Um, it's all a lie. Wall Street's full of liars. Not everybody, by the way. I, I've got to give you a big caveat. The most people you're dealing with on the phone are honest, and they're trying to do the right thing. It's the people at the top, and it's the regulators. And if you want to blame one person, you can blame Gary Gensler, but he's a mouse. He's just purchased. You've got to blame Lloyd Blankenfield and, and uh, Jeremy Black and, and uh, uh, Stevie Cohen and Ken Griffin and, and whoever the hell runs Morgan Stanley and Jamie Dimon. Jamie Dimon allows this to go on in the precious metals markets. It happens in the bond markets. The United States securities markets are a den of thieves. They're all crooks, and the rest of the world is catching on. That was a point that Patrick Byrne hammered home. We used to have the financial markets that the world looked up to. And he told the story of China, telling him in China there are no fails to deliver. There are no fails to deliver. And Patrick said, well, there's got to be sometimes, you know, there's somebody forgets to sign the paperwork, somebody uh, de delays or something. And the Chinese guy said, you're not hearing me. There are no fails to deliver in China. Well, guess what? China is building an oil exchange. China is building a precious metals exchange. China is inviting our students to visit China. China is setting up a uh, uh, legal regime that's honest. China is setting up a trading trading systems which are honest. Honest. And if you're the uh, majority of the world's population under 40, who live in the Middle East, live in, live in, uh, oh, that's the wrong street, live in uh, uh, Africa, live in Southeast Asia, live in China, live in India, where are you going to invest your money? In the corrupt uh, uh, Leon, uh, Leon Fink markets? Or are you going to do it where... The markets are honest. And where, where's that market going to be? China. China. All right, I'm going to leave it at that because I'm, I'm, I got to turn off up here. I wish everyone well. Peace, love, and puppies. <laughs> Peace, love, and happiness. Um, uh, I'm sure I left something out. But we've got a big battle, but we've made such progress. And it's all you. It's you guys. It's you guys. Remember to trade the market with the awareness that they're, they sell stock shares into existence. They just sell into the thin air. They get cash. The system protects them, not you. And so when stocks run up, take your profits. And if you miss out on the run, at least you protected your corpus. If you're like me, you made a couple of mistakes like going down and doing the interview for the movie and ignoring your account one day. The key is don't let your money... <clears throat> I don't like stop limit orders because they'll take your stock away from you. But you want to make sure that you don't 
lose that ability to invest in the new idea. There will be new ideas. There will be new setups. But if you, if you get down to your last shuck with nothing left to lose, it's tough to make money. It takes my money to make money. All right, best of luck to everybody. I hope, uh, more than anyone, I hope that, that Ham's finger options work. And I, ho I wish each of you wealth and happiness and uh, a, a dog running up to you to say hello or a cat, kitten or a horse or a bird or a squirrel. So over and out, cheers.